I have a nice, safe, well-defined topic to discuss with you today, the world. <laughs> when, when Martin spoke to me, he said, um, talk about what you think will be the biggest event in 2019. So, of course, huge trap right out of the gate. I'm going to get it wrong. Um, here's what I think is going to be the biggest event in 2019. The subject that is going to have a greater impact on you, your clients, your businesses, China. Now, I do know, I do know that two ministers have left the government over SNC-Lavalin. I do know that. I do know that there will be testimony this morning from the principal secretary to the prime minister. I am aware. Um, I do know there's some tragic farce going on called Brexit over the ocean. And when I think of March, by the way, Sangeeta, I think of the Ides of March, right? <laughs> the rest of you think about March break, I think about the Ides of March. And I do know that India and Pakistan last week walked up the ledge towards some sort of confrontation with nuclear weapons. So I do know all that, but I still, I'm gonna stick to my guns that the big story for 2019, the one that is likely to have the biggest impact on you, on this country, on Canada, on our future, is China. Now, why do I say that? If you read about China, and, and if you've been to China, and I was just asking whether you've been, and you said yes, I don't know, how many of you have been? Okay, great, that's at least half the room. You know, China is stunning, frankly. Um, you get off at a gleaming, clean airport, um, beautiful terminals everywhere. Um, China has built five subway lines in the time that we've been talking about the relief line in this city. <laughs> we'll probably build another five, I'm convinced. Um, you know, wonderful highways, and it has lifted a half a billion people out of poverty in the last 35 years. So what they've done, frankly, is unparalleled, um, and they deserve a huge amount of credit for it. But what's beneath this story, and that's what I think is worrying many experienced China watchers. The first, when you look at the Chinese economy, the growth, the dynamism in the Chinese economy has come from what part, would you think? The private sector, right? And these are small and medium-sized businesses, not unlike um, the kinds of companies that you deal with. They have provided the dynamism, they've created the employment, um, and they led China to become the world's manufacturer, frankly, and their companies grew very large. But the, when we look at China today, what's happening? Those lumbering, clunky, unnimble state-owned enterprises are now growing again at the expense of the private sector. That's frankly in the wrong direction. That's not where China needs to go if it's gonna go through its transition. Secondly, and if you have business partners or you're in a supply chain um, that involves Chinese companies, what do you hear? And I hear this all the time. The Chinese Communist Party just think, how many of you have management responsibilities? Or, okay, or on a senior executive team? Well, here's the world that your counterparts are living in in China. The Chinese Communist Party now has a representative on every senior management team. 
we think we have problems in Canada with political interference. Just imagine that one. So, and this is recent. This is only since Xi Jinping, the current president of China, um, assumed office and ended term limits on his, uh, on the capacity to serve as president. Before that, there was rotation every 10 years. He's abolished that. So, to make the point clearly, the state is back in the economy of China in a big way. That's, frankly, in the wrong direction. Third, and this I think all of you will know, the demographics in China are unforgiving, right? A lot of people look like me in China. And after Japan, China is the oldest society in the world. The United States is young in comparison to China. Now what happens when you have an aging workforce? Productivity goes down. Social services go up. Expenses go up. And that's the big worry about China, and we talk about it in a very concrete way. In another 10 years, China hits the wall because older people will outnumber younger people in China, and China's population, believe it or not, will actually start to decline. China is in a race to get rich before it gets old, right? You've heard that expression. And it doesn't have a long horizon ahead. Now, What's the Chinese government doing right now? As its economy is slowing, which it is, and it's not slowing, don't be misled by the press, sorry to any journalists in the room, it's not slowing because of the Trump tariffs. That's just the icing on the cake. It's slowing because of the three factors that I just talked about. It's doing what China always does. It's stimulating its economy. Do you remember when the current government came to power and the Harper government as well during the recession talked about building our infrastructure in order to stimulate the economy? Remember shovel-ready projects? Well, we have the shovel in this country, but we weren't ready is all I can say because you don't notice much of a change in our infrastructure. China is again investing in a massive way in infrastructure, but that infrastructure, believe it or not, is overbuilt. There are highways in China with few cars. There are apartment buildings where nobody is living. What China needs to do is strengthen the capacity of its consumers to buy. And again, we're going in the wrong direction here. So in a stunning report that I read just two days ago, there was a round table, private, off the record, and actually one of our Canadian banks was in that discussion, so that's how you hear about private conversations, frankly. And here's, here's what he brought back. Here's the story he brought back. These Chinese private sector leaders were saying, we're counting on Trump. Just imagine that. We hope, just think about this. We hope that Trump will hang tough because only Trump can force Xi Jinping to open the economy, um, to restructure, um, to allow more competition, and to let some fresh air into an economy that is increasingly being stifled. Well, let me tell you, it's a good thing I wasn't in that room because I don't think I could have restrained myself. I would have said, don't count on Trump, all right? Um, and it's very likely that you will see before March is out some cosmetic deal between the United States and China over trade 
which addresses almost none of the structural issues that we've been talking about. So this will be an ongoing story. Let me take just a minute or two here to talk about one company that you all know very well, Huawei. Um, and we can only really understand Huawei when we understand the larger context um, in which Huawei works. Huawei is China's only truly global company. It has, you know, Alibaba, which is the, which is the equivalent of Amazon. It has 1.4 billion people. It has big market. But it, that's what it is. It does not have, you are not buying your latest vacuum cleaner on Alibaba, right? So it's not really effective outside its market. Huawei is a global competitor with the next generation 5G technology. What's 5G? Fifth generation technology, uh, which is just over the horizon. It will be here by next year. And it's revolutionary technology because it's platform technology. What does that mean? When it's in place, we will truly be in the world of the internet of things. Because it will take you five seconds to download a movie. It will connect everything. You may not want this. I don't. I really, I do. I want a stupid fridge. <laughs> I love stupid fridges. Smart stoves drive me crazy, frankly. They're always telling me what I'm doing wrong and giving me choices I don't want. But it's not going to matter. Everything is going to be connected to everything in the Internet of Things. And more important than my fridge or my stove, our electricity grid is going to be connected on the Internet of Things. Our transportation networks are going to be connected on the Internet of Things. That's what the 5G technology promises to do, and Huawei's a world leader in this technology, which is, again, an amazing story about China, that it's been able to do this. But, and here's where when I look into the future, here's really what I see. If you think back, and there are some people in this room who can think back 20 years ago, when the internet really took off, we thought, oh my goodness, we can talk to anybody anywhere now that we're hooked in, now that we're connected. This is truly the beginning of connecting the world on one platform. It was, we didn't talk about it, it was an American platform. The internet was built in the United States by American scientists and American companies. Well now, here's Huawei that says, we're doing the next one. And the United States says, no, you're not. That's why there is an extradition request for Meng Wanzhou. That's why Trump the administration has gone to every single country, including ours, Canada, and said, no Huawei components in the core of the network. Why would they say that? And let me just illustrate for a second, and I'm watching this clock. Why would they say that? How many of you have Apple phones in this room? Okay. When you get that little note from Apple that says, your software needs an update, do you do it? Yeah, the most responsible amongst us do it, right? The rest of us just go on living our lives. But we do it because we believe two things at the same time. We believe there's a vulnerability in the phone. They're going to fix it. We don't know what it is, but it's in the code. We're going to fix it. And we also believe they're going to sell our data to the advertisers who are most interested in what we want to buy. But we're probably more or less okay with the second. We want our patch, our phones patched and the vulnerabilities fixed. When Huawei sends you an update, you gonna update your phone? 
How many people would up their phone, update their phone from Huawei? How many people might worry that there would be something in the code? Okay, that's what our government is wrestling with. Our government has been launched in an all-out review. Every single government ministry is involved. Do we ban Huawei from the core part of the 5G network? Frankly, the only reason the decision is not announced is because there was an extradition request for Meng Wanzhou, and China has reacted with fury. It has arrested two Canadians. It just escalated the charges yesterday. It has just now canceled a very large canola oil contract that it has with us. And as this continues, the stakes are going to get higher and higher. Why are they so furious, people ask me. Because Huawei is their global company, their best, iconic. It would almost feel like Sheryl Sandberg being taken off a plane in Vancouver because the Chinese requested her extradition. Can you imagine what we would be hearing from the United States about that one? Here's the takeaway line for you and why this matters to every one of you in the room. China and the United States are re-bordering the world. That's how I think about it. They are putting borders back where they've been gone. It's entirely conceivable that two years from now, and that's 5G is around the corner, that two years from now, there will be a Chinese internet and there will be a US internet. And you will not be able to move across seamlessly in the way that you're all accustomed to, you, to doing. That's gonna have consequences for virtually every business that you deal with especially when everything's connected to everything. It's gonna have huge consequences for the Canadian economy. We are gonna to need to be, and if you're reading between the lines here, that's okay with me, we are gonna to need to be tough, strategic, clear-eyed, focused, as we figure out how we maneuver as this competition over technology deepens and escalates between the United States and China. We are a small country with 30 million people. So we need to compensate for size by smarts. That's the story of 2019. And thank you for listening. <laughs>